We hear a lot of talk from politicians in Washington, as we should, about the debt. We don't hear as much, I don't hear, about the economics of it all. Why don't you give us your analysis of what we should be concerned about with the debt and what we should not be as concerned about? Okay, there is a pretty strong case that debt is just a, a number, that the, the United States... Um, absent, you know, the political games over the debt ceiling, which is a really you know, uniquely American dysfunction. Aside from that, there's no hint that financial markets are concerned about America's ability to service its debt. There's no real sign that the debt is putting any strain on the economy. Um, there are U.S. debt is very high for by our own historical standards. The only time we've been close to this level was in the immediate aftermath of World War II, but it's not that high compared with what a lot of other countries have experienced over the years uh, without any kind of crisis. So, you know, it, the, any, the numbers are enormous, but everything about the US economy is enormous. So you say $31 trillion and you do your best Dr. Evil imitation, but it's not at all clear that the debt is top priority, you know, that it's a catastrophic issue or even that it even belongs in the top five or maybe even the top 10 of issues to concern the United States. So maybe not catastrophic, but is it, is it a growing problem in this sense? The debt itself is just one number. What about when you put it together with another number, which is debt service? Because as I understand it, part of the question is uh, how fast is debt service cost growing? We have had essentially zero cost of, of debt service. Those are going up now. Does that pose a real risk? The idea that having to that, that we're in, that we're in some kind of debt spiral where we have to borrow to pay interest and then we have to I mean the numbers don't support that at all. The numbers don't suggest that anything like that is going to be a problem for the foreseeable future. Uh, so no, I mean it just it's um, we've gone from a point where money was you know free or even uh, in real terms possibly. Uh, uh, we were being the federal government was being paid to take on debt to one where it costs something, but it's still pretty small. So let's talk about some of the proposals about how to avoid raising the debt too much, and that is some capping of spending, particularly discretionary spending. What are the possible consequences of that if, in fact, we do freeze or reduce spending off of 2022 levels? What really bothers me where we are right now is that the programs that apparently are sacrosanct are programs for the elderly. Medicare, Social Security uh, are off the table. They're being protected. And a lot of the stuff that's discretionary is really things like uh, uh, programs that support uh, children, that support education, that support nutrition for the young, which is the future. So what's happening right now is that in the effort to hold down headline spending Right now, we're actually kind of disinvesting in in the country's future, and that's that's pretty alarming. So, so that is a, a terribly important and very unpopular point. Going back to the politics for a moment here, and, and that is when you say let's cut things for the elder. That's not very popular. I'm elderly at this point, but at the same time, we're not really investing in future growth, as I understand it, by paying more, for example, on Social Security. Whereas investing in education or children or infrastructure could increase the future growth. To what extent do we need to be concerned about growing ourselves out of whatever debt issues we have? Well, to a large extent, that's going to happen anyway. I mean, I, when I say you need to adjust for inflation, you really also need to ask about growth. And, you know, the, the example I always like to use is, you know, how did we pay off the debt from World War II? And the answer is we didn't. Uh, uh, we had slightly higher debt when John F. Kennedy w took office than we did on, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when we declared victory over Japan. Um, but the debt had dwindled. Uh, it was... You know, it was less than half the share of GDP that it had been at the end of World War II because we had a growing economy and a little bit of inflation over that period. And that's largely, we're still in a world where we, we really are already set to, if not exactly grow out of our debt, at least not have it grow very much you know, uncontrollably unless we do you know, some really uh, even, even more irresponsible things than we do now. So, uh, and look, if, if you want to try to accelerate economic growth, there's not a lot of things that we know work. Uh, investing more in children's health, nutrition, um, is one of the things that we do know works. 
but it you know works with a very long lag or something that will show up 30 years from now in, in a better economy. Uh, aside from that, if you ask what can we do to make the economy grow a lot faster over the next 10 years, the answer is nobody knows the answer to that. Uh, so, Professor, you referred to the size of the, the debt uh, going back to G GDP. Right now, the projections, I think we're somewhere around 97, 98 percent of GDP, something like that right now. And the projections from CBO, as you know, go up to 120 percent and maybe keep going. At what point do we become concerned about that? You say now it's not a problem, but when does it become a problem? When would you start saying, wait a second, we're running into trouble? Um, it's hard to come up with a number. And, you know, we look at Japan with 200 percent of GDP, and Japan has lots of problems, but unwillingness uh, of the market to buy Japanese government bonds is not is not one of them. Um, I always uh, I like to point out that the if we go back uh, to you know the Industrial Revolution in in Great Britain, uh, first half of the 19th century, Britain had debt uh, that was 180 percent of GDP at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. By 1850, it was only down to 130% of GDP. And this is the, you know, this is the Industrial Revolution. This is the birth of the modern age taking place under what anybody now would say, oh, that must be a crippling debt burden. So, uh, you know, is, is there any, there must be somehow, you can't have, uh, our debt can't exceed our total national wealth. Uh, but we're nowhere close to that. And I, I don't see any number anywhere in these projections that is one that, based on history, would lead you to be concerned. One of the things we hear about from some quarters, at least, is a concern about the strength of the dollar. That, in fact, the, the globe will lose some confidence in our fiscal abilities here in the United States. And we have seen uh, sort of a dilution of the dollar as the, the reserve currency of the world. Fewer transactions, as I understand it, today are being transacted in dollars than before. You've written about the fact that you don't think there's another currency that will overtake it, but that perhaps it will become more of a plurality. Is that a likely development? And if so, what would be the consequences? I always say that the big problem is not that something else might take the dollar's place. The problem is that there may be nothing else that can take the dollar's place. When you think about the alternatives. The euro uh, is uh, unfortunately the because of, of euro crises and divergences. There's not a, a euro bond market. There's just there's an Italian bond market, a German bond market. So that's a fragmented market, which means that euro securities are not liquid in the way that dollar securities are. Uh, China has capital controls. It has a, an authoritarian regime given to making erratic, sudden changes in policy. Who wants to use RMB as as a as their key asset? Uh, Japan is just too small uh, an economy. So, you know, the it's not that the U.S. derives a huge advantage from the fact that the dollar is the currency in the world. Um, it's that the world derives a huge advantage from the fact that there are safe, highly liquid assets that can be used as collateral, that can be used as the sort of underpinning of the whole world financial system. And those safe, liquid assets are U.S. Treasury securities. And if we manage to destroy the credibility, then the whole world, including us, but not the whole world suffers. It's not that somebody gains at our advantage. It's that we, we undermine the whole system.